Hello folks, my name is Rifat Bari. I'm a perfect 4.0 GPA student at uh, the City College of New York where I study math and physics. Today, I'm going to derive for you the spherical wave equation by using the Laplacian in spherical coordinates. Don't worry, we're going to be doing some very basic math, uh, addition, subtraction, so it should be accessible for all ages from uh, first grade to uh, high school. So let's get started with the derivation. Let me just uh, clean up the board. Let's get started with what the wave equation actually is. In cylindrical coordinates, the wave equation is as follows. Uh, you may have seen it written as u sub tt is equal to c squared u sub xx. In other words, the second partial derivative of the wave with respect to time is equal to the second partial derivative of the wave with respect to space times c squared. c is the speed of the wave. Uh, that c is very suggestive because it can be the speed of light, for example. Um, but this is the equation for, uh, you can use it to represent a planar wave. So for example, a wave that looks like this in time. Um, and so yeah, this is the uh, this is a very famous equation. It is the two dimensional two actually two dimensional or one dimensional. Yeah, let's let's be safe rather than sorry. One dimensional wave equation. One dimensional wave equation. Right? Uh, the two dimensional one is very similar. And same same idea for you know three dimensions, four dimensions, etc. Okay, so now I want to show you how to derive the spherical wave equation. Well, what is a spherical wave? First of all, spherical waves are actually much more com not much more common, but uh, because you can obviously produce these planar waves in the lab. But spherical waves are what's produced by a light, um, a, a light bulb, for example. If you have an LED, then it produces. Let me draw it actually instead of blabbering on. If you have a, a little LED or some kind of a light source, it's an isotropic light source, meaning it emits the same amount of light, ideally in all directions. And so that creates a kind of spherical wavefront, right? That shows how the light wave propagates outwards, right? So over time, the light wave is gonna propagate more and more. And so the radius of that spherical wavefront is going to increase, right? So that's the intuition behind uh, the equation we want to derive, right? So our goal is to derive the spherical, spherical wave equation, wave equation. All right, so first step we got uh, to write down is the Laplacian, right? What is the Laplacian? The Laplacian is uh, kind of, why don't I first write it down? The Laplacian is, is kind of like the second derivative but in 3D space or n-dimensional space. So the Laplacian of psi, psi being the solution to our wave equation, is going to be um, partial squared of psi with respect to each position variable, okay? Now, let's uh, do one of these together and then the rest are going to be pretty trivial. So let's start with the fact that we know that uh, in spherical coordinates, the sum of the squares of the Cartesian coordinates is just the square of the radius of the spherical wave front. This is just Pythagorean theorem, right? X squared plus Y squared is equal to uh, Z squared, just in 3D. So um, just from this, believe it or not, you and assuming that the spherical wave front um, wave equation depends only on its radius, just from these two things, we can derive the entire spherical wave equation. And if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what does, honestly. So let's go ahead and get started by finding uh, partial phi, partial x, and then we'll differentiate again to find the second derivative. So partial phi, uh, I don't know what it's called. I think, no, this is psi, yeah, sorry. So partial psi, partial x is going to be what? Well, we know psi depends on r principally, so we're going to have to employ the multivariable chain rule. It's not as bad as it sounds. And then we take the derivative again, right? So partial uh, squared psi partial x squared is going to be what? Well, now you just use the product rule, right? Operate on this one, then this one, add them together. So partial partial x of partial phi partial r times partial r partial x plus 
partial fee. Hopefully, I have enough space. Uh, partial, partial, one of my yes, x times partial r, partial x. Now, this immediately I can combine it into a, just one second partial derivative, second order partial derivative. And here, I'm just going to use um, what is known as Clay Root's theorem to uh, switch these two. So, I'm going to bring my partial r here and my partial x here. This is not what it looks like. I'm not using fraction fraction uh, arithmetic here, okay? The only reason I can do this is because I assume that psi of r is not a pathological function and instead it's a continuous smooth uh, three-dimensional function that uh, whose mixed partial derivatives are equal. That's the only reason I can do that and I'm allowed to do that, I'm permitted to do that by a Clairoux theorem. So let's go ahead and simplify this. So I'm going to have partials, uh, the second partial derivative of psi with respect to x is equal to partial partial, what is it, r? Yeah, uh, partial psi x, uh, partial r x. And you'll see why I did that in a second. Uh, I'll show you. And here, of course, I just have my second partial derivative of r with respect to my position variable. Now, partial phi, partial, uh, partial c, psi, partial x, I know what that is, right? It's this, right? So let's go ahead, plug in, and expand this guy. So partial, partial r of partial psi, partial r, partial r, partial x, times partial r, partial x again, plus partial psi, partial r, partial square r, partial x squared. Now, check it out. These two guys squared up. These two guys, that's a second order partial derivative. So I'm going to have partial squared psi, partial r squared, times partial r, partial x, whole square, which is not the same as the second partial derivative, uh, second order partial derivative. And so we're left with this. Now that we have the second partial derivative with respect to space, all we have to do is find out what r sub x and r sub x x is and plug them in into this partial derivative. Let's do this now. And finally, we found the partial derivatives with respect to the x-coordinate, y-coordinate, and z-coordinate. And finally, after adding them all up, this is what we get. All we have to do now is remind ourselves that the right side of the one-dimensional wave equation is 1 over the velocity of the wave squared times the second partial derivative of the wave with respect to time. Now that we realize this, all we have to do is realize that the solution to the spherical wave equation, u, let's call that solution u, takes the following form, f of r plus minus vt, which is exactly the solution to the one-dimensional wave equation, right? Now we just solve for psi, and we see that psi is c1 uh, times f over r plus uh, c2 times g over r. And there, that is the final equation for a spherical wave. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. And if we simplify it just a bit further, we'll get the equation for a spherical harmonic wave, which is sinusoidal. And there you go. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode of Crazy Maths and Physics. We'll see you in the next one.